this one, Manifesto Part 2, is actually called Irrational Realist. You know, because the first part of my manifesto is about the art form, but the second part is, you know, what are you doing with the art form? You've got to stand for something. So I looked for stuff to stand for and realized most of it was bollocks. <laughs> the only thing that you, gives you any foundation is simply other people. That's where you've got to put your, your faith and your love, because everything else, as the, the poem will we'll, we'll elaborate upon, <laughs> is bollocks. So this poem is called Irrational Realist, Manifesto Part 2. I am the first of the irrational realists. I am the last of the irrational realists. I am merely the latest to realize the absurdity of my own philosophy, but I have found other ways to approach this shared reality. I get it wrong badly. I get it wrong gladly. Because the right answer is just too obvious. You know, everyone else seems to have figured it out, and to be honest, I can't see that it's not any of them any good. So I will be an irrational realist, the first, the last, the 753rd of a new yet ancient order, proud to be numerically illiterate, for I have found that numbers and lists are like snowflakes, each profoundly unique and each profoundly identical, covering the earth in a colourless, featureless blanket. The great blizzards and swarms of numbers fall into earth like binary precipitation, turning it all into a cold and biting winter. And we will try to console ourselves by building snowmen as if we could turn all these seas of meaningless digits and data into things that could be people with feelings and faces and top hats and scarves. But we will learn, as every child must, that snowmen cannot laugh or hug or cry and they have no trace of true humanity no matter how many cute button noses and eyes we give them. The numbers can never reach out to hug us in our sadnesses, and there is no cold calculation that could ever compare with the violent, thrashing embrace of lovers whose feelings have nothing to do with mathematics and whose only response to ice is fire. And that's not all I refuse to pay homage to. I've had the science beaten out of me by a schooling that mixed words and fists without distinction, by a lifetime spent listening to words with too many syllables to possibly be real, and half-baked press release epiphanies about cloning and regeneration and self-aware robots, and all the things we promised ourselves were impossible, but now seem to be only a matter of time, till I remember that there were so many things I've always never known that UFOs might as well be weather balloons to me, because I wouldn't be able to recognise either one if I did see them. And I know that there are creatures living at the bottom of every garden, whether they're called insects or fairies is a moot point, because every new discovery about the amazing ways in which bees make hives and ants make nests reminds me that all creatures are not just material but magical, not just biological but epistemological, that nature never realised these concepts were supposed to be oppositional, that allows all things to be at once in a unity so beautiful, sometimes I think it must be impossible. What is impossible when physics tells me that there are tiny particles of undetectable energy that can push entire universes apart, as if this wasn't the simplest proof of magic anyone could ever need? But I am told that all entities with mass are attracted towards each other by a force that people with academic degrees call gravity, but which I think we might as well call love. You don't believe me? Read a textbook. Oh hell, read the next book. They're all the same. I am an irrational realist, and I believe there is no book worth the paper it was printed on, especially if the... the price of that paper is the logging of the very same trees that keep this planet alive. There is no God-given book holy enough to warrant that sacrifice, no sacred word that deserves these altars of arboreal blood. And if the fanatics say these texts are to be revered, they are the vessels of the Lord's will, I say no. God is a spirit that floats between words. He cannot be contained by a page, no matter how sacred. He is a holy trinity. He is laughter and love and song. And if you tell me that I've gone and hurt your feelings, I reply, no one has a right not to be offended, me included. I am proud of my thin skin. I count every scar a blessing, for in my mind, strength is only a means to cause injury. And if you don't punch yourself, you only punch the ones you love. So if I am going to try and love the world, I will do it with the softest possible caress and never flinch at its thoughtless lashing out. You should try it out. Join me at this point of no return, where we promise to never turn the other cheek. For if you strike me here, I will look you square in the eye, spit out the blood and loose teeth and smile. Because every blow that rains down on us will only remind us when we are bruised, we are beautiful. When we are bleeding, we are beautiful. And when they tell us that their faith will make them strong, then we will be the meek that inherit the earth. 
For our eyes will be unfettered, our hands unshackled and our backs unbowed. We will stand tall and strong and beautiful with eyes that shine with clarity and hearts that burst with a love that has no need for the validation of holy words. I offer you a godless crusade and I offer you the promise that man does not need a deity in order to stand tall. Man does not need a prophet in order to seek the truth. Man does not need scripture in order to know where to lay his feet. And if you tell me that I'm self-contradictory, too scatological for any form of internal consistency, I say yes! And isn't it glorious that no one now dares to understand me? For I am an irrational realist, and I refuse to be bowed down by comprehension. I'm throwing away philosophies like cigarette butts, because those puppies are all burned out. I'm shedding ideologies like snakeskin, because those bastards used to make me hiss and slither, and now, by God, I'm going to fly. I'm going to believe in the people, so that even if I don't miraculously grow wings, I can rest on a billion shoulders, a pinnacle of humanity that reaches to the sky. The winds are not beyond our grasp. We've already claimed them with our turbines and our kites, and once the genetic scientists finish rebuilding us, we can hold them with our very fingers. Icarus' only mistake was that he turned his back on his fellow man, his father, for fuck's sake. You can't throw disrespect like that around so casually and expect there to be a price to pay. I believe that the Tower of Babel was not an allegory, but a challenge. God, he called us out. He said, come on, bitches, how high do you think you can get? <laughs> He's not the one who screwed us over. We did that to ourselves and we stopped listening to each other, started building in different directions. You know, I'm glad that bloody thing fell over. And I'm glad they were smart enough to make such a bloody good novel out of it. <laughs> now... I mean, it's been 3,000 years since we burst out of Mesopotamia. 50 years since we reached all the way to the moon. Why the hell do we keep telling ourselves the heavens are beyond our grasp? We've found all the frontiers. All that's left is tomorrow's yesterdays. We've found all four other dimensions. And even though there are whispers that there might be more, we, we visit them in our dreams and bring back the small creatures that hide in the salt shakers and cutlery drawers. And even though they speak in trans-dimensional tongues that might be gibberish, I know what they're saying. It's, it's a promise and a reminder that all of our knowledge is God-given and self-devised, all of our power is secular, sacred and profane, all of our technology is biological and ideological, and even though that it is only the smallest, most impossible voices that say this, they will keep shrieking, trans-dimensional rage, shaking the salt shakers and creaking on our floorboards all through the wee hours of the night, and this is the, the truth of the unspoken midnight, it cannot be denied, I will not be denied, for I am the first of the irrational realists, watch out or my reality will break you, watch out or my reality will make you join me and then we will be the first of the irrational realists.